This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people who will hold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jockler 66, Hour of the Truth. This is the sixth reading of the introduction of the book The History of the Inquisition by Limborch. I did yesterday a recording of this and then in the evening I met with Brett Norman who accompanied me to two recordings that we did yesterday on the fantastic book The Secret History of the Jesuits from Edmond Paris. And of course there I also mentioned that I'm doing this recording here and how sometimes when you read the one book you use it to explain something in the other book that you are reading. And doing this book, The History of the Inquisition, really helps in understanding a lot of other things and I get a clearer and clearer view of history. So I'm just saying this so that you understand that we're studying real history, omitted history, omitted from our schools, universities, libraries and our pulpits in the churches. When you understand and study these, omit, this omitted history then you will get a much clearer view of things of the Bible, of Christianity, of religion altogether and how the world is running. And the better you understand it, the more you grow in the faith. Because let me be clear, there is not one book that tells the truth but the Bible in this world. Okay? It is not that in Limborch's history of the Inquisition is the totally truth to be found, or in Romanism and the Reformation from Henry Gretton Guinness, or in... Uh, James Atkin Wiley's Rome and Civil Liberty, or in Francis Rooney's The Global Vatican, or in Edmond Paris's The Secret History of the Jesuits, or Frederick Tapasorsi's Rulers of Evil, the truth is only to be found in the Bible. But the truth that is written in the Bible needs these historic books 
because these historic books confirm what is written in the Bible. And therefore I think it is interesting to read these books. And the more I read this book, the more I love it, I have to tell you. So <clears throat> during the day today I have had a little time and could prepare a little bit of the reading that I'm doing right now and I don't know if I can do this whole one hour recording in, at once. But um, that doesn't matter. The most important point is that we start and we start at page 51 as any, everybody can see on the screen for the one who wants to read along. And we are still de dealing with the history of the persecution and the subsection of the persecution amongst Christians upon account of religion. And this is part 6 already. Now we begin with Anastasius. Anastasius, who succeeded the emperor Zeno, was himself a great lover of peace and endeavoured to promote it, both amongst the clergy and laity, and therefore ordered that there should be no innovations in the church whatsoever. But this moderation was by no means pleasing to the monks and bishops. Some of them were great sticklers for the council of Chal uh, Chalcedon, and would not allow so much as a syllable or letter of their decrees to be altered, nor communicate with those who did not receive them. Others were so far from submitting to this synod and their determinations that they anathematized it, whilst others adhered to Zeno's Henoticon and maintained peace with, uh, with one another, even though they were different uh, they were of different judgment concerning the nature of Christ. Now, what is Zeno's Henoticon? Hmm? Sometimes you read words in this book that you've never heard before. So I looked it up and Wikipedia explains Henoticon um, is an uh, act of union, was a Christological document issued by uh, Byzantine Emperor Zeno in 482 in an unsuccessful attempt to reconcile the differences between the supporters of the Council of Chal uh, Chalcedon and the Council's opponents. It was followed by the Acacian Schism. I will not go any further into this, you can read this article for yourself, but what I will do is to provide you the link, as you can see, the Wikipedia link, to Henoticon and also to the Acacian Schism, that you understand what that is, in the description box of this video, so you can study it for yourself. Now, the author continues, hence the church was divided into factions, so that the bishops would not communicate with each other. Not only the eastern bishops separated from the western, but those of the same provinces had schisms amongst themselves. Division, huh? The emperor, to prevent as much as possible these quarrels, banished those who were most remarkably troublesome from their sees, and particularly the bishops of Constantinople and Antioch, forbidding all persons to preach either for or against the Council of Chalcedon, in any place where it had not been usual to do it before, that by allowing all churches their several customs, he might prevent any disturbances upon account of innovations. But the monks and bishops present, uh, prevented all these attempts for peace by forcing one another to make new confessions and subscriptions and anathematizing all who differed from them as heretics, so that by their seditious and obstinate behavior they occasioned innumerable quarrels and murders in the empire. They also treated the emperor himself with great insolence and excommunicated him as an enemy to the synod of Chaldean, Chalcedon. Now this is very interesting when we read through this. They, the bishops excommunicated <laughs> the emperor. That is exactly what the successor of these bishops, the bishop of bishops, the pope of Rome, will do with emperors and kings if they don't dance to his music, huh? even to the day to day. So we see that there was not that was not even a quote unquote invention of the coming Antichrist, but already the bishops, the 
abomination that was already working did that already. Now Macedonius, the author continues, who is a bishop of Constantinople, and his clergy raised the mob of that city against him, only against him, the emperor, only for adding to one of their hymns these words, who was crucified for us. And when for this reason Macedonius was expelled his bishopric, he urged on the people to such a height of fury as endangered the utter destruction of the city, for in their rage they set fire to several places in it, cut off the head of a monk, crying out he was an enemy of the Trinity, and were not to appeased till the emperor himself went amongst them without his imperial diadem and brought them to temper by proper submissions and persuasions. And though he had great reason to be offended with the bishop for such a usage, yet he was of so human and tender a disposition, that though he ordered several of them to be disposed for various offences, yet apprehending that it, could not be effect, um, that it could not be effected without bloodshed, he wrote to the prefect of Asia, quote, not to do anything in the affair, if it would occasion the shedding of a single drop of blood." Unquote. Under this emperor, Symmachus, bishop of Rome, expelled the Manichees from the city and ordered their books to be publicly burned before the doors of the church. Now the Manichees I think I looked up and I will explain later who they exactly are. Justin was more zealous for orthodoxy than his predecessor Anastasius and in the fifth year of his reign gave a very signal proof of it. Severus, bishop of Antioch, was warm against the council of Chalcedon, and continually anathematizing it in the letters he wrote to several bishops. And because the people uh, quarreled on this account and divided it into several parties, Justin ordered the bishop to be apprehended and his tongue to be cut out and commanded that the synod of Chalcedon should be preached up through all the churches of the empire. Platina also tells us that he banished the, Arian, that, that he banished the Arians and gave their churches to the Orthodox. Hormista, also bishop of Rome, and in imitation of his predecessor Symmachus, banished the remainder of the Manichees and caused their writings to be burned. Now, as I told you, I looked up the Manichees, and I will give you the link of newadvent.org, which is a link to the Catholic Encyclopedia Online, and tell you what it says in one sentence here, because I just copied that out for you, that you can understand that what these Manichees, who were now banned, and their writings were burned, were, quote, Manichaeism is a religion founded by the Persian Menai in the latter half of the 3rd century. It purported to be the true synthesis of all the religious systems then known, and actually consisted of Zoroastrian dualism, Babylonian folklore, Buddhistic ethics, and some small and superficial additions of Christian elements. Now, actually then I think we can call the Roman Catholic Church today the modern Manichees, because they also mix all religions together to found their one religion, their one world religion. Huh? Now, Justinian, his successor in the empire, succeeded him also in his zeal for the Council of Chalcedon and banished the bishops of Constantinople and Antioch because they would not obey his orders and receive the decrees of that synod. He also published a constitution by which he anathematized them and all their followers and ordered that whosoever should preach their opinions should be subject to the most grievous punishments. By this means nothing was openly preached in any of the churches but this council, nor did anyone dare to anathematize it. And whosoever were of a contrary opinion, they were compelled by innumerable methods to come into the Orthodox or Catholic faith. In the third year of his reign, he published a law ordering that there should be no pagans, there should be no heretics, but Orthodox, meaning Catholic Christians only, allowing to heretics three months only for their conversion. 
By another, he deprived he deprived heretics of their right of succession. Meaning, when somebody died, the law of succession is that somebody will be the heir. They could not give in a will their belongings to the people they left behind anymore, but it was confiscated by the state. That's what this means. He deprived heretics of the right of succession. By another, he rendered them incapable of being witness in any trial against Christians. He prohibited them also from baptizing any persons and from transcribing heretical books under the penalty of having the hand cut off. These laws were principally owing to the persuasions of the bishops. Thus, Agapetus, bishop of Rome, who had condemned uh, Anthemus and deposed him from his see of Constantinople, persuaded Justinian to banish all those whom he had condemned for heresy. Pelagius also desired that heretics and schismatics might be punished by the secular power, if they would not be converted. So, what do we see here? Pelagius desired that heretics and schismatics might be punished by the secular power, if they would not be converted. This is the working together of church and state. The secular power is the state. And Pelagius, who was a bishop, desired that heretics and schismatics would be punished by the secular power if it would not be possible for the spiritual power, the church, to convert these people. Later on, there was written a book by Edmond Paris, published by Chick Publications, called Convert or Die. This is not so far away from that. Huh? The emperor was too ready to comply with this advice. But notwithstanding all his zeal for orthodoxy, means Catholicism, and the cruel edicts published by him for the exportation of heresy, he was infamously covetous, sold the provinces of the empire to plunderers and oppressors, stripped the wealthy of their estates upon false accusations and forged crimes, and went partners with common horse in their gains of prostitution. And what is worse, in the estates of those whom those wretches falsely accused of rapes and adultery. And yet, that he might appear as pious as he was orthodox or Catholic, he built out of these rapines and plunders many flatly and magnificent churches, many religious houses for monks and nuns, and hospitals for the relief of the aged and infirm. Evagirus also charges him with more than uh, bestial, cruel, uh, cruel, bestial cruelty in the case of the Venetians, whom he not only allowed, but even by rewards encouraged to murder their enemies at noonday in the very heart of the city, to break open houses and plunder the possessors of their riches, forcing them to redeem their lives at the expense of all they had. And if any of his officers punished them for these violences, they were sure to be punished themselves with infamy or death. And that each side might taste of his severities, he afterwards turned his laws against the Venetians, putting great numbers of them to death, for those very murders and violences he had before encouraged and supported. Now, during his reign in the 24th year of it, was held the 5th General Council at Constantinople, consisting of about 165 fathers. The occasion of their meeting was the opposition that was made to the four former General Councils, and particularly the writings of Origen, which uh, Eustochius, Bishop of Jerusalem, accused as full of many dangerous errors. Yes, Origen is a so-called 
church father of the early church, but he was a Catholic. Let's put it that way, an Orthodox. Okay, it's not because the name origin comes from, from comes from there that it is a good thing. Eh? Now, in the first sessions, it was debated whether those who were dead were to be anathematized. Hmm. What does the Bible say about people who are dead? The dead know nothing, so why would you even anathematize them? They are dead already. But one Eutych, uh, Eutych, Eutychius looked with contempt on the fathers for their hesitation in so plain a matter and told them that they needed no deliberation about that they needed no deliberation about it, for that King Josias, uh, Josias, sorry, formerly did not only destroy the idolatrous priests who were living, but dug also those who had been dead long before out of their graves. So clear a determination of the point, what could resist? The fathers immediately were convinced, and Justinian caused them to be consecrated bishop of Constant uh, him to be consecrated bishop of Constantinople in the room of Minas, just deceased, for this his skill in scripture and casuistry. The fathers immediately were convinced, and Justinian caused him to be consecrated bishop of Constantinople in the room of Minas, meaning in the place of who just deceased before, for this his skill in scripture and casuistry. What casuistry? Well, the casuistry that we've just read about, when he said that there needed no deliberation about it, for that King Josias formerly did not only destroy idolatrous priests who were living, but that also those who had been dead long before out of their graves. So, of course, he says, let the dead be anathematized. His skill in scripture, as they call it here, which is nothing because he doesn't know scripture, otherwise he would know what the scripture says about dead people, but using this casuistry, casuistry and sophistry that the Jesuits use today, that made him bishop. Now the consequence was that the decrees of the four preceding councils were all confirmed, those who were condemned by them re-condemned and anathematized, particularly Theodorus, bishop of uh, Mopsuestia. Yeah? Mopsuestia. Yeah, I looked that up and you can look that up also where that is. I will put the Wikipedia link in the description box of the video. So the particularly Theodorus, bishop of Mopsuestia, and Ibas, with their writings as favoring the impieties of Nestorius. And finally, Origen, with all his detestable and execrable principles, and all persons whatsoever who should think or speak of them or dare to defend them. After these transactions, the Synod sent an account to them to Justinian, whom they complimented with the title of the most Christian king, and with having a sole partaker, and with having a sole partaker of the heavenly nobility. <laughs> what in a name? What is the heavenly nobility? Where is that to be found in the Bible? That you address our Father who is in heaven, the creator of this world and everything that is in it, as heavenly nobility? I was just stumbling on this expression and thought, well, maybe we think about that a little. Now the author continues, and yet soon after these flatteries, his most Christian majesty turned heretic himself, and endeavoured with, with as much zeal to propagate heresy as he had done orthodoxy before. He published an edict <coughs> by which he ordained that, quote, the body of Christ was incorruptible and incapable even of natural and innocent passions, that therefore his death, that before his death he eat yeah, 
that before his death he eat in the same manner as he did after his resurrection, receiving no conversion or change from his very formation in the womb, neither in his voluntary or natural affections, nor after his resurrection. Unquote. But as he was endeavoring to force the bishops to receive his creed, God was pleased, as Evagarius observes, to cut him off, and notwithstanding the heavenly nobility of his soul, he went, as the same author charitably supposes, he went to the devil. The punishment follows directly the um, how do you say that? <laughs> the crime, you know. <laughs> He published an edict by which he ordained what I just read to you about Jesus Christ, yeah, that even before his death he eat in the same manner as he did after his resurrection, receiving no conversion or change from his very formation in the womb, neither in his voluntary or natural affections, nor after his resurrection, and the punishment was but as he was endeavoring to force the bishops to receive his creed, God was pleased, as Evagarius observes, God was pleased to cut him off. And notwithstanding the heavenly nobility of his soul, he went to the devil. That comes from blaspheming. Some people God will punish right away. Some people God will punish at the judgment day. Hunaric, the Aryan king of the Vandals, treated the Orthodox in his empire's reign with great cruelty in Africa, because they would not embrace the principles of Arius. Some he burned, and others he destroyed by different kinds of death. He ordered the tongues of several of them to be cut out, who afterwards made their escape to Constantinople, where Procopius, if you will believe him, if you will believe him, affirms he heard them speak as distinctly as if their tongues had remained in their heads. Now, Justinian himself mentions them in one of his constitutions. Two of them, however, who happened to be whoremasters, lost afterwards on this account the use of their speech for this reason and the honor and grace of martyrdom. Before I continue, I want to go back to this sentence that I was here. When I said that uh, after the transgression of the law, God punishes right away. I was looking for that word transgression. Please forgive me, sometimes these words are right on the tip of my tongue, but they just don't come out at that moment when I need it. But let's turn the page and we read on on the top of page 54. Justin, the younger, who succeeded Justinian, published an edict soon after his advancement, by which he sent all bishops to their respective sees, and to perform divine worship according to the usual manner of their churches, without making any innovations concerning the faith. As to his personal character, Justinian that is, as to his personal character, he was extremely dissolute and debauched, and addicted to the most vile and criminal pleasures. He was also uh, sordidly covetous, and, fall and, and sold the very bishoprics to the best bidders, putting them up to public auction. Now, why did I put this in color? Because it is a sign that I want to make a comment. <laughs> Justinian was not only covetous, but he sold the very bishoprics to the best bidders, putting them up to public auction. That is a word that we already met once in this reading before, two or three parts ago, that is called simony. Simony is the term that is used to buy an ecclesiastical office, an office within the church. And this is what Justinian did. He sold the bishoprics to the best bidders, putting them up for public auction. Now, where does the word simony come from? Do you have any idea? Let me help you. 
in Acts we read of Simon Magus, Simon the Magi. And Simon the Magi wanted to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit. If I'm not mistaken, it was Acts chapter 7 or chapter 8. And he was thrown out of the jurisdiction of Judea by, Paul, by Peter. And this Simon Magus became the first Pope. That is the Simon Peter that the Roman Catholic Church is building her foundations on upon. And this Simon Peter took his sorceries to Rome and established his church there. And that is the Roman Catholic Church. And that is why Simon Peter is the name giver to simony, which is the buying of ecclesiastical positions. That's exactly what he tried to do with the apostles. He wanted a part of the Holy Spirit and buy it. Didn't understand that the Holy Spirit was a gift by God. Like salvation is a gift. Like grace is a gift. He didn't understand it or he didn't want to understand it because he was possessed by another spirit. And he was actually the name giver of the word simony. And here we see that Justinian did the same thing. He used simony to put those people into the positions who paid the most and that money of course went to him. But okay, let's continue. Nor was he less remarkable, Justinian, for his cruelty. He had a near relation of his own name whom he treacherously murdered, and of whom he was so jealous that he could not be content till he and his empress has trampled his head under their feet. However, he was very orthodox, <laughs> he was very Catholic, and published a new explication of the faith which the clearness and subtlety exceeded all that went before it. In this he processes, and now follows a very lengthy quote, that he believed in Father, Son and Holy Spirit, the consubstantial trinity, one deity or nature or essence, in one virtue, power and energy, in three hypostases or persons, and that he adored the unity in Trinity, and the Trinity in unity, having a most admirable difference and a union, the unity according to the essence of deities, the Trinity according to the properties, hypostasis or persons, for they are divided indivisibly, or, if I may speak so, they are joined together separately. The Godhead is the three is one. Uh, the Godhead in the three is one, and the three are one, the deity being in them. Or, so speak more, uh, to speak more accurately, the three are deity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Now let me interrupt here. Where does the Bible ever, ever teach God the Holy Ghost. Where does the Bible ever teach three different persons? This is heresy. Heresy according to the Bible. But because the Roman Catholic Church puts her teachings and her dogmas above the Bible, they call everything else heresy. But this is pure blasphemy. God the Holy Ghost? There's no such thing in the Bible. That the Spirit of the Father and Jesus Christ is a God, is not centered in the Bible. That is centered in paganism. That is centered in Roman Catholicism or Orthodoxism, which we are reading here about. Okay? 
The Godhead in the three is one, and the three are one, the deity being in them. Or, so, uh, or to speak more accurately, the three are the deity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, each person being considered by itself the mind, thus separating things inseparable. The three being understood to be together God, being one in operation and nature. We believe also in one only begotten Son of God, the Word, for the Holy Trinity receives no addition to a of a fourth person, even after the incarnation of the Word of God, one of the Holy Trinity. But our Lord Jesus Christ is one and the same, consubstantial to God, even the Father, according to his deity, and consubstantial to us, according to his manhood. He suffered in the uh, he suffered in the flesh, but was Im, uh, impassable in the deity. For we do not own that God the Word, who wrought the miracles, was one, and he that suffered another. But we confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God, was one and the same, who was made flesh and became perfect man, and that the miracles and sufferings were one of the same. For it was not a man that, ha that gave himself for us, but God the Word himself, being made man without change. So that when we confess our Lord Jesus Christ to be one and the same, compounded of each nature, of the Godhead and manhood, we do not introduce any confusion or mixture by the union. Yeah, I'd say, no confusion. For as God remains in the manhood, so also nevertheless doth the man, being in the excellency of deity, Emmanuel being both in one and the same, even God and also man. And when we confess him to be perfect in the Godhead, and perfect in the manhood of which, of which he is compounded, we don't introduce a division in part or section to, the, to his one compounded person, but only signify the difference of the natures, which is not taken away by the union, for the divine nature is not converted into the human, nor the human nature changed into the divine. But we say that each being considered, or rather actually existing in the very definition or reason of its proper nature, constitute the um, the oneness. Yeah, constitute the oneness in person. Now, this oneness as to person signifies that God, the Word, meaning one person of the three persons of the Godhead, was not united a pre-existent man but that he formed to himself in the womb of our Holy Lady Mary, glorious Mother of God and ever a virgin, and out of her in his own person, flesh consubstantial to us and liable to all the same passions, without sin, animated with a reasonable and intellectual soul. For considering his inexplicable oneness, we orthodoxly confess one nature of God, the Word made flesh, and yet conceiving in our minds the difference of the natures, we say they are two, not introducing any manner of division. For each nature is in him, so that we confess him to be one and the same Christ, one Son, one Person, one hypostasis, God and man together. Moreover, we anathematize all who have or do think otherwise, and judge them as cut off from the holy Catholic and apostolic Church of God. Unquote. To this extraordinary edict all, says the historian, gave their consent, esteeming it to be very orthodox, though they were not more united amongst themselves than before. Well, esteeming it to be very orthodox, as the author says here. Yeah, what we just read is very orthodox, in the sense that orthodoxism in this book, here at this moment, is Roman Catholicism. This is very orthodox, this is very Catholic. You know, I always get sick when I have to read this, about our Holy Lady Mary, glorious Mother of God and ever a Virgin. 
so many lies and one little part of a sense. Mary was as holy as all Jesus following Bible believing Christians are holy. When we follow our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us on the cross, we are holy. We are the saints, the saints that the Bible writes about. Not the dead people, the Roman Catholic Church, after their death, sacrosancts and makes holy. We are the holy followers of Jesus Christ. So Mary was not more or less holy than every other Christian. Every other person who believes that Jesus died for him on the cross and with his shed blood washed him free of the sins. After three days he rose again and went up to the Father in heaven where he still is. When you believe that, you are holy. And of course, when you keep the commandments and keep the laws of Jesus Christ. If you do all the things I said first, and then you give a damn about the law, the Ten Commandments, then of course, that's something else. But otherwise, you are saved, and you are by that made holy by the one who is holy. So our whole, holy lady Mary, she is as holy as every Christian who accepts Jesus Christ as holy. Glorious mother of God. I get sick when I have to read sentences like this. And ever a virgin? No. Because after she gave birth to Emmanuel, she gave birth to her firstborn Jesus, she had normal relationships with her husband Joseph. And she bore several other children. And we know biblically of at least four brothers and two sisters of Jesus in the flesh here on earth. We can read that in the Bible. So she was not a virgin after giving birth to Jesus Christ anymore. Because then she consummated her marriage with her husband as it is supposed to be. You know? Now, under Mauritius, John Bishop of Constantinople and a council held at that city styled himself ecumenical bishop by the consent of the fathers there assembled. And the emperor himself ordered Gregory to acknowledge him in that character. Gregory absolutely refused it. Yeah, we are speaking about Pope Gregory who still was subject to the emperor. Gregory absolutely refused it and replied that the power of binding and losing was delivered to Peter and his successors, meaning himself, the Pope, and not the bishops of Constantinople. So we are making the distinction between the bishop of Rome and the bishop of Constantinople. Again, under Mauritius, John, Bishop of Constantinople, in a council held at that city in Constantinople, styled himself ecumenical bishop by the content of the fathers there assembled, and the emperor himself ordered Gregory to acknowledge him in that character. So Gregory, the bishop of Rome at that time, the pope, absolutely refused it and replied that the power of binding and losing was delivered to Peter and his successors, not to the bishops of Constantinople, admonishing him to take care that he did not provoke the anger of God against himself by raising tumults in his church. Now the yellow sentence is of course a very important one, otherwise I would not have highlighted it. Listen closely. This Pope, Gregory, was the first who styled himself Servus Servorum Dei, servant of the servants of God, and had such an abhorrence of the title of universal bishop that he said, Gregory himself said, I confidently affirm that whosoever calls himself universal priest 
is the forerunner of Antichrist by thus proudly exalting himself above others. Now, I hope that you get this. John, Bishop of Constantinople, at a council held in Constantinople, with the consent of the fathers assembled over there, wanted to be acknowledged in that character of Bishop of Bishops. And Gregory in Rome absolutely refused it and replied that the power of binding and losing, being the Bishop of Bishops, Servus Servorum Dei, servant of the servants of God, only was a title that belonged to the successor of Peter, between quotation marks, the successor of Peter, meaning the Bishop of Rome, not a Bishop of Constantinople. And he, Gregory himself, was the first who styled himself Servus Servorum Dei, servant of the servants of God, but had such an abhorrence of the title of universal bishop, meaning he took every other title to absolutely describe that position, but he did not take the title of universal bishop, which is another word for Pontifex Maximus, because Gregory himself understood the scripture this well, for example in uh, Second uh, Thessalonians, that he said, quote, I confidently affirm that whosoever calls himself universal priest is the forerunner of Antichrist by thus proudly exalting himself above, other, above others, unquote. This is what Pope Gregory himself said. Now, I have a few Wikipedia pages open here, and you can read about Pope Boniface VIII, so this is coming now. Very interesting. Pope Gregory means he does not accept the title of universal bishop because he says, no, when I'm universal bishop, I declare myself antichrist. I'm not going to do that. But however modest Gregory was in refusing, the author continues, and condemning this arrogant title, antichrist, <laughs> Pope Boniface III thought better of the matter and after great struggles prevailed with focus, that is, the emperor of Rome at that time, and the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire at that time, he prevailed with focus, who murdered Mauritius, the emperor that we were just speaking about, under Mauritius, you remember here, on the top of what we just read, to declare that the see of the blessed apostle Peter, which is the head of all churches should be so called and accounted by all and the bishop of it ecumenical or universal bishop. Here we have it. And the word universal bishop does not mean anything else but Pontifex Maximus. So we are speaking about the time of 606. 606. Now, I open my note here. This is in the time of 606 unto 1866. And this deals with the 1260 days, the official reign of the Antichrist, the three and a half years or the 42 months prophecy from the Bible explained from not an Servants Day Adventist point of view, because that is the point of view almost everybody universally <laughs> Catholic in this world holds today. Do you get it? The SDA teaches, and everybody sings along, and I did also because I didn't study it real, really, but Romanism and the Reformation actually opened my eyes to that there was another possibility. The two Babylons of Alexander Hislop exactly did the same thing and teaches an alternate time between 606 and 1866. And here in this book also we can see it and we can see it creden credentialed by historical facts that we will go to or go through in the next few minutes. Now, the point being is that the reign of the Antichrist, 1260 days, three and a half years or 42 months, 
that is the prophecy of Daniel or the prophecy of John the Revelator. They both speak of this period, is the reign of the Antichrist, and it depicts the time where the Pope had absolute temporal power and where the Pope had absolute spiritual power. Now with this attempt here under Pope Gregory, we can see where he took the first time the term servus servorum dei, meaning servant of the servants of God, that he paved the way for the successor, Pope Boniface III. Not to mix him up with Boniface VIII, who wrote Unam Sanctam. That's another pope and another evil person, of course. Now, Boniface III, he thought better of that matter than Gregory, and he took the title Bishop of, uh, uh, and the Bishop of it Ecumenical, and the universal bishop. Universal bishop meaning Pontifex Maximus. Now, I have opened a few links in Wikipedia here. We can read this one and I will of course provide to you the links in the description box of the video. And you can read here about Pope Boniface III just on Wikipedia. You can also of course open it up in uh, the Catholic Encyclopedia and read much, much more on Pope Boniface III if you want to. But we are reading here about his uh, reign as Pope and he only was a year uh, in, uh, uh, in office. But as you can read here, and effectively it ended the attempt by Patriarch Syracuse of Constantinople to establish himself of universal bishop. Yeah. Um, then there is a link from the Catholic Encyclopedia about Boniface the Eighth, uh, the Third. You can read that also. I will not go into that right here because that is not the idea of the book, but it is to incite you, my dear listener, my dear Christian brethren, to do your own research, and if not on the links that I provide you, on links that you find yourself. Also in the Catholic Encyclopedia, we can read about the Pope and the institution of a supreme head by Christ, how they interpret Matthew 16 that the Apostle Peter was the successor of Jesus Christ. And of course they are lying through their teeth because this Apostle Peter, Simon Peter, never was in Rome. But the Peter that they build on, as I said earlier, was Simon Magus. And I'm going to do a complete reading of that pamphlet called Simon Peter versus Simon Magus, who really was the first Pope. And then I have another link for you provided, and that is from the Wiley Online Library, Anchoring Pontifical Authority, a reconsideration of papal employment of the title Pontifex Maximus. You know, very interesting to read um, these few things. And um, what we also find on the internet is that such titles as Universalis Episcopus, that was used by Boniface III, a year after Gregory's death, we just read that in the book, Pontifex Maximus, or Sumus Pontifex, Virarius Christi and even Ipsius de Interes Virarius, first vicar of Peter, then vicar of Christ, at last vicar of God Almighty. There are numerous links on the internet where you can find this, what I just show you here. Okay? So, Pope Boniface III was the first pope after the fall of the Roman Empire to really combine church and state, call himself universal bishop, what another word for is Pontifex Maximus, and called himself vicar of Christ. And by that, he was the one to seize universal power on himself. And with this, the 1260 years that were prophesied by the prophet Daniel and by the apostle John the Revelator in the book of Revelation, 
the 1260 days, the three and a half years, the 42 months, which we know, speaking prophetically, a day is a year, 1260 days is 1260 years, Th three and a half years is 42 months, 42 months is 1260 days, and 1260 days is 1260 years. All these prophecies being fulfilled, counting from that moment on of Pope Boniface the third. Of course you can say, yeah, but in 538 they also had a reason, and in 1798 General Berthier went into Rome and uh, took, the Ro uh, took the Pope captive, and these are also historical facts. Well, yeah, they are. But we are speaking here about the spiritual power. You have to know, or you have to consider, please, that the Pope has, as he self claims for himself, he claims for himself spiritual power and he claims for himself temporal power. Yeah? That means the one and the other are both combined in this one office. So even when we agree that 538 through 1798, which is the SDA teaching, is for the temporal power, then we here have absolute proof, historically, through Emperor Phocas and Pope Boniface III, in 606, 607, to take the spiritual power on himself. And this spiritual power was broken in 1866. And how do you say now, where is that? Well, there are articles on the internet that you can find. You can have to look for it. I have them on my browser, but I don't care to open them right now. When you Google this time frame, then you know that at that time there was a protective guard of a militia of France in the Vatican to protect the Pope. Because at that time Italy was in rebellion. Italy was the last country in Europe then to lay hands on the so-called papal states and take away the complete temporal power of the Pope at that time. And between 1866, when the French took their troops away from the Pope, from the, from the Vatican, the Pope was there defenseless and that power was taken away. And from 1870 on, even with starting of the first ecumenical council, uh, the first uh, Vatican Council, um, the Pope locked himself behind the doors of the Vatican and he didn't come out until 1929, which we all know is the time of the restoration of the wound, when Mussolini gave back the temporal power, the kingdom, to the Pope in, uh, on February 11th, 1929. Okay? So this is a real interesting history that this book deals here with for the moment. And... Um, I think it is really important for us to understand this, that not everything that uh, is taught everywhere also has to be true because of this. We have to consider, um, <clears throat> we have to consider uh, several different time frames. I don't say that 538 to 1798 is wrong and a lie. I just say it is not telling the whole truth. That's why I said. And you can read this here, I don't say the SDI lies, I just say that this prophecy of the 42 months, 1260 days or three and a half years is explained from a not Seventh-day Adventist point of view. We have always to take into consideration that the Seventh-day Adventists never will tell the complete truth because they were founded by Freemasons who are controlled by the Jesuit order. And it is this little points, these little points that they give wrong dates or don't tell the whole story that we can see. Look, from this one article, I think this is from the New Advent Org or this online library. You can search it up for yourself if you want to. I took this little uh, quote here. Title of Supreme Priesthood or Pontifex Maximus. So Universal Bishop is the same as Pontifex Maximus. When Boniface III assumed that title, he claimed universal spiritual power, and that was in 606 or 607 
AD. Now you will not find that quote word for word in these articles, I put that together of my understanding. And you can always write me in the description box, uh, in, the, in the comment box of the video, what you think about it. But I've researched it in the meantime more than enough that I'm very, very sure that here at least we are speaking of the spiritual power that was taken by the Pope. And that ended the 1260 years. Now, it's been going on for now almost an hour, uh, 70, 58 minutes. So I think we can better conclude this video here because I leave you with a lot of things to think about. And next time I will just start here and uh, continue my reading of the book The History of the Inquisition by Philip van Limborg, written in 1692 and translated in 1731 into the English language so that we can read it. I hope you enjoy and that you will take this advice that I told you to do your own research, not only on concerning these parts, but also concerning other things. Don't take anything for granted. Don't take my research for granted. Don't take anybody else's research for granted, no matter what name they have, no matter what title of professor, doctor or whatever they carry. It doesn't matter. What matters is the truth, and only the truth. And this book, The History of the Inquisition, and the book Romanism and the Reformation, where Henry Greg and Guinness mentioned this book, these are already two books that give another view of the 1260 years. And also there is, look it up, in chapter 7 of uh, Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons, is the same a different time frame mentioned than the so-called universal SDA teaching, 538-1798. These are just facts that I tell you. What you do with those facts, what you believe, what you research, that is up for your own. So anyway, I thank you very much for watching, commenting, and continue to do your own research. And of course, continue please to follow my book reading of this wonderful book, The History of the Inquisition by Limborch. Until next time, Jogler 66 from Hour of the Truth wishes you all the best and that God may keep and bless you all the time. Until next time, signing off. Bye bye.